Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service this morning, where I would like to welcome the Reverend Stephen Allison to our morning service, and we pray that we will enjoy blessings together and that we um, are able to worship the Lord in, in truth and in sincerity. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you today and to, to visit with you from Kiltarwate and uh, to have some friends here and others I don't know, but it's, it's great to be able to join with you today as we worship God. Just before I begin, I was asked by the Presbytery to formally announce that your new interim moderator is the Reverend Malcolm McLean, who's going to be making contact with you and being in touch shortly, but just to formally announce that Malcolm McLean has been appointed as your new interim moderator. As we worship God together, I'm going to read some words from the book of Ephesians as our call to worship, our new identity in Christ. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. We're going to join our voices together and sing to God's praise from the hymn, Come People of the Risen King.
Well, let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can gather this morning as your people, your church, your family, your dwelling place. Father, we confess before you this morning the ways that we know even over this last week we have let you down, we have forgotten to put you first, we have neglected our obligations, our duties to you as our great and mighty God. But we rejoice afresh this morning in your mercy to us, your compassion, your love for us. We give you thanks that we are welcomed as your people. Despite our failings, despite all the ways we let you down, we are still yours, your precious possession. And so we rejoice that as we gather today, we gather in your name, we gather to worship you, our mighty God, to give you thanks for all that you have done for us, especially through Jesus, that you have redeemed us, you have set us apart as your own. And so we pray that as we gather, you might be among us, your Holy Spirit might be teaching each of us from your word, from as your word is read, as your word is preached, as we sing to you. And we give you thanks as well, Lord, that you are the God who hears our prayers, who welcomes us to come to you with the concerns and worries of our hearts. We know that as we gather here, people gather with so much going on in their minds. The stresses of this last week or the joys of this last week. But we pray that as we gather, you would still our hearts. You would draw us near to you. You would be at work in our lives. You would help us to listen to your words, to receive it. And you would help us to have the spirit of worship. Comfort those who mourn in her grieving. Bless us, unite us together as your people in this place. Be among us, Lord. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to um, speak to the, the young people, and I've got something to show you. Um, most of you are over there, so I'll move this over to this side, and I'll come and speak to you. Okay. So I've got here a cloth, a, a kind of white cloth, and I've got something else I'm going to use in a minute. But I want to ask you a question, and possibly quite a hard question. What does the word sin mean? Do you know what sin is? Yeah? Shout out, yeah. What's sin? <laughs> okay, so, so sin is, is, is bad things that we do, things that um, upset God, and good things that we don't do that we should do. And so, do you ever do anything bad? <laughs> no, you never do anything <laughs> So some of you have brothers and sisters, don't you? Yeah. And do you ever fight with your brothers and sisters? Do you ever... <laughs> so when we do bad things like this, when we fight with our brothers and sisters, um, I tell you what, do you, do you ever not do what your parents tell you to do? Do you ever not do what your parents tell you to do? When we do this kind of stuff, it's like this, if our lives are a bit like this cloth, it's like these dirty marks get put onto the cloth. So you see that the, the kind of the mess starts to form. And we, of course, don't just sin once. We keep doing wrong things, putting more and more of this mess onto the cloth. Now, do you think you can hide this mess? Do you think you can fold this in such a way that you won't be able to see the mess? Or do you think this is ruined? What do you think? Yeah, it's a mess. And then do you know what we do as well? We go into the world and we all sin, not just us here, every one of us sins, and we go into the world and we make a mess of the world. So as that kind of dye goes into the water, it looks pretty horrible, doesn't it? Would you like to drink that? No? Yeah, someone said yes, okay. But look at this cloth now. Would you believe that that was white before? No, it's gone all kind of dirty and horrible. So how do you think we can get rid of this mess? 
Any ideas? How, how do we get rid of the mess in our lives? Well, that's where Jesus comes in. So Jesus, God's son, came to earth, and unlike us, he was completely clear, completely perfect, pure in every way, and Jesus went to the cross to die to deal with all this mess. So he was able to take this mess onto himself. And Jesus was still perfect, but he was able to deal with the mess and get rid of all that mess in our lives so that we could be forgiven. (laughs) And then God calls us to be part of his church, for each one of us to take this message of good news about Jesus, to tell others and help other people to come to know Jesus and have that mess taken away. (laughs) All right, let's pray together. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for Jesus coming into this world to help us to have that mess, that sin dealt with in our lives. And I pray for all the young people here that as they grow, you would help them to understand more and more who Jesus is and all that he has done for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. We're now... I'm not sure when the kids go to Sunday school or not, but I presume they'll go at the the right time. But we're now going to do the, the, the Lord's Prayer together. So we'll have the Lord's Prayer on the screen. Um, I don't, do you stand to say the Lord's Prayer or sit? That's fine. Well, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Have fun at Sunday school. (laughs) And we are now going to read together from God's Word, and we're going to read two passages together. First of all, a passage in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. And then we'll also read in Ephesians, chapter 4. Acts chapter 2 from verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and one Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love and every part does its work. Amen. And may God add his blessing to his word to us. Well, we're going to sing again, this time from the Sing Psalms, Psalm 84, verses uh, 1 to 7. And the tune for this is All Saints. We'll stand to sing to God's praise. What do you think of when you hear the word church? Has COVID-19 perhaps challenged or changed your perspective on what the church is? Do you instantly think of a particular building style, architecture? That's perhaps in common English what the word church has come to mean, the building. But this morning I'm more interested in what God's words, the Bible, says about church. This is God's manual of how we are to live out the Christian life within the church. When we look at the word church in the Bible, we find it's a translation of a Greek word, ecclesia. At the simplest level, the word ecclesia just means gathering or assembly. 
And at the time of the New Testament being written, it was used in this context, not just, out, not just in a religious context. It meant a gathering or assembly. But very quickly in the New Testament church, it took on a whole new meaning. It came to refer to the gathered group of Christian believers who met weekly to worship God together and to serve him together. And while at a basic level, this word ecclesia means gathering or assembly, like many words in Greek, it's actually a compound noun where you take other words and you push them together in order to create a different word. So though it means gathering or assembly, literally it means the called out together. So the church is not just a building. The church consists of those who have been called out by God, gathered by God, given new life in Jesus, united to one another, gathered together to worship God and to serve God. Now, the Bible's full of amazing metaphors and pictures to help us understand what the church is, but at its most basic level, the church is the family of God. Now, every family has its rules, has its traditions. One of the most challenging aspects of getting married is that a husband and wife come together with different upbringings, different backgrounds, different ideas of the way they think things should be done. One of my sister-in-laws recently was asked to give advice to a couple who were getting married, and her and her husband's advice was, there is no right way to load a dishwasher. (laughs) Every family has its own traditions, its own ways, and they come together. Each of you is part of Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church, and you've come from different backgrounds, different experiences, different places. Maybe you've been raised in the church all your life, but maybe you've been in more than one church. Some things you've liked in different churches, some things you didn't like. Even if you've been in the one church, you've probably seen the church go through changes. Or maybe you're newer to church, you don't have all that baggage but you probably still have your own ideas as to what the church should be like. So as we gather together, as the called out people of God, we come with our own ideas. Now that can be a great thing. We can learn from one another. Maybe you've got this fantastic idea of how we can reach this community around us with the good news about Jesus. But it can also, we know, create tensions, create challenges, just like in any family. And all of that perhaps starts to reveal why I think the topic of the church is so important. In Cotality Free Church, as we emerged from the second lockdown, I began a series looking at the church, thinking through aspects of what it means for us to gather as the church. Because I think what lockdown, what COVID-19 has revealed to all of us is a lot of the things we thought we knew, we thought we understood, are not quite right. We need to operate go back to the basics of what the Bible says about the church and think through what that looks like. What does the Bible see as essential as part of church? And what does that look like in our place, in our culture today, in Dingwall, in 2021? And so we we had a series on the church and the sermon I'm going to preach to you this morning was was the opening of that, the beginning of that series. And this evening, I'm going to be um, sharing with you um, an aspect of it. The whole series was built around the aspects that we see in Acts chapter 2. And so this evening, we're going to be looking at hearing God's word together because they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching uh, is an important part of what made the church what it was. But this morning, we want to begin at the uh, kind of an overview. I'm not going to answer every question this morning about what the church looks like, but I would encourage each one of you to be reading the Bible. And as you do so, think about what it says about the church. Think about how you can live that out, how you can be part of that in your church. I want to suggest that we really need to, though, begin by asking this question, how do churches grow? And that's how I want to begin this morning. Not because we want our our church to grow for us, But we want our church to grow because we want people around us to be coming to know Jesus. We want people around us to come to know this good news. We live in a society when there's so many things trying to pull you in different directions, when so many different ideas are out there. But we know that we have the truth. We have Jesus Christ, the only name in heaven and earth by which men can be saved. So we want to share this with people. So we want our church to grow. 
We want people to come to know this. And we also want to grow ourselves as Christians. We want to be progressing in our faith. And so as I started to think about the church, I looked at, um, I read Acts, which seems a good place to start with the church. And there were three verses in particular that struck me in the book of Acts. One we read, Acts 2, verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts 9, verse 31. The church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So the church, uh, Acts 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. In each of these, perhaps you start to see that there's a connection between what's going on in the church, the fact that the church is being strengthened in the faith, or the fact that they are walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. There's a connection between what's going on inside the church and the growth that comes. And I wonder, what if the reason we don't see more growth in our churches is because we're not living out God's design for his church? And would that change things if we started to get serious about what the Bible says about the church? Would we, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, become this compelling, attractive community of believers that you see in the New Testament, who reach out to the world around them and are transformed? We've said, like, we, we see it around us that our society is becoming more and more fragmented, more and more disconnected, and yet people desire a genuine sense of community. And that genuine community is what the church is meant to be. So my conviction is that if we spend time praying, reflecting, and thinking about what the church is, exploring God's word, seeking to actually live it out, allowing it to challenge us individually, then we'll begin to see the church grow the way God intended it. So I want to begin with this vital question, how do churches grow? And there's a ton of material out there we could point to that tells us how we should grow our churches. Numerous church growth studies, compelling vision, inspiring leadership, committed membership, self-reflecting humility, flexible structures so we can respond to what's going on. And all of these can be helpful and worthwhile, but many of these principles would grow a business just as well as a church. And the church is not a business. Numerical growth, economic growth are not what really matters. We want spiritual growth. We want those in the church maturing and deepening in their faith. And we want those outside the church beginning that faith journey. We want to honor Christ in all that we do as we grow. So certainly we can learn from other churches. We can use tools that other churches have used for growth, things like Christianity Explored. All of these things are useful. But we can't blindly copy ministry patterns from other places. They have their own context, their own resources, their own history, and they're different from us. So instead, we need to work out how the biblical principles of church that we find in God's word apply in our situation. So what are the biblical church growth principles? What does God's word reveal to us? Well, that's where in Ephesians chapter 4, I think Paul explicitly outlines the fundamental principles of how all churches grow at all times. There's nothing weird, there's nothing complicated here. He has three simple principles but I think that the prayerful, careful application of these principles will take us time. It will take us sacrifice to work through. But this is how God grows churches. Three principles. Everyone united. Everyone ministering. And everyone maturing. Everyone united, everyone ministering, and everyone maturing. First of all, then, everyone united. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul's concerned that every church has this deep sense of unity that reflects the unity which we've already been given in the heavenly church. The calling each one of us has received is not just to become a Christian individually, it's to become part of Christ's church, his body. And disunity amongst the people of God destroys the work of the gospel. 
when I was studying church history, I remember hearing about uh, George Whitfield, who you may have heard of. He was a famous preacher, evangelist, and he once came to Edinburgh to speak and preach in various churches in order to call people to salvation. And the secession church, which had left the Church of Scotland, withdrew the invitation for him to preach. Why? Because he was also preaching down the road in the Church of Scotland. Disunity destroys the work of the gospel. They didn't want him to preach for them because he was preaching in other churches who they were not part of. And we know that the history of the church has often been like this. Division, schism, breaking apart, Christians not working together, ignoring our call that we are all united in Christ. And we also know that same division can occur at a local level. Well, we might not have open opposition to one another, but there are people we find it easier to get on with than others, so we spend our time with them. We get to know them, but we ignore others who are equally part of our family in, Je in Jesus. But it's so contrary to the gospel. The gospel is meant to be this great equalizer. In Galatians, Paul writes, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Each of those things, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, were the great dividing markers in that culture. And Paul's saying those barriers mean nothing in the gospel. Our society is just as divided. Maybe it has different identity markers today, but it's just as divided. And the gospel is still meant to unite people together because of our common love of Jesus. Each of us has failed God time and time again. And yet God in his mercy has shown us grace. He's called us into his church. So who are we to exclude someone or to put anyone else down who God has called? Paul's great prayer for the church is unity. It's the foundation. And it has to be that way for us as well. If we are not united as a church, we'll all be pulling in different directions and we'll be achieving nothing. But if we're working in the same direction, in the direction God would have us go as a church, there's no end to what we can achieve. So Paul outlines three basic attitudes for achieving this unity. Being humble, gentle, and patient. Paul first tells us to be humble. So what does humility actually mean? Humility is not about being shy or backing off or, or kind of having that, you know, that facade of false modesty, which is actually pride in disguise. Humility has its roots in an Old Testament idea. It's a word that perhaps you've kind of heard of, lowliness. Lowliness. The humble is someone who recognizes their low condition, not compared to other people, but compared to God. And so because they recognize that creator God is so much greater than we are, they recognize that we need God's help. They rest in his care. They trust his strength, his abilities rather than their own. And this reflects how we are all meant to be as people made in the image of God. And so we need to be humble. We need to recognize who we are before God, that we need him. We utterly depend on him and that we can trust him. We need to recognize our weaknesses and our gifts are all things that God has given to us. So we can't make too much or too little of either. Rick Warren puts it like this, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's thinking about God more. Next, we're to be gentle. Now, this is not being weak, but it means dealing with people in kindness rather than roughness, with soft encouragement rather than bullying. So we don't urge people to improve their behavior to raise up to the standards of Jesus by just pushing them, by just shouting at them, by just telling them how bad they are all the time. Instead, we set a good example. We care for one another. We seek to get alongside one another. We help one another. And third, we're to be patient, which basically means long-suffering of the faults of others, slow in seeking to rebuke others, recognizing that spiritual growth takes time. We're all a work in progress, so we're patient with one another. We're patient with those who are younger in the faith who might at times seem unreliable to us or lazy. 
And when we experience someone showing us less love than we think we need or, or treating us a way that, we, that affects us, we try to understand. We don't seek to immediately break down relationships, but we seek to be reconciled. Our Western culture tries to encourage us to be self-promoting, opinionated, aggressive, ambitious for ourselves. There's this attitude, you've got to get ahead. But those attitudes are so contrary to the way of God. They strangle growth in the church because we all end up pulling in different directions. By contrast, though, Jesus, our Lord, was famously humble, gentle, patient with everyone that he met. And we know that because he's been incredibly gentle, patient, humble with each one of us. Obeying Paul's words here really means growing more like Jesus because he's our ultimate example. Growing in Christ-like humility, gentleness, and patience is what enables us to achieve Paul's twin aims in this passage, that we would bear with one another in love and we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace that we would do all that we can to unite with one another. This is what church should be like. We've all been adopted into God's family. We've all had peace with God. And therefore, peace with each other is the logical conclusion. Because you don't serve a different Christ than I do. We all serve the same Christ. This is the unity that God has brought in Christ. So when tension arises, as it will in every church, rather than seeking to stir things up, rather than gossiping, we prayerfully encourage one another, help one another, listen humbly to one another, speak gently, forgive patiently. Because, as Paul says, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So first principle, everyone united. Second principle, everyone ministering. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Verse 7. Every single believer in Christ has been given grace, without exception. Now, Paul is not talking here about the grace that is ours, grace alone that saves us through Christ dying for us. This isn't about saving grace. This is about an additional grace that's given to us as believers. Gifts of ministry or service that Christ has distributed to us. These are not for our own personal satisfaction or for our own reputation, but to enrich the life of service in the church as we serve others. These are not just gifts. These are ministries, ways for each one of us to serve the church. So none of us should feel inadequate or superior because it's Christ that's apportioned the gifts and what we are to be involved in. We all, though, have something to contribute to the church. And in the fact, if, our, if we don't contribute our gift, if we don't contribute our role, the whole church is weakened because of it. We eventually discover, if you've been around church long enough, that we all need the ministries of other people. None of us can go it alone in the church. You can be the best person in the world about um, sharing God's word with people and, and explaining how God's word applies to their life situation. But you're probably not very good at applying it yourself. We need one another. And so the diversity of ministries in the church is something that's to be celebrated, to be enjoyed. There's no point feeling envious of someone else's gift or proud about your own because it's Christ that's given them. So where do we serve others by praying for them? by reading the Bible with them, by encouraging them, by serving teas, coffees, by cleaning the church, by welcoming, being on the sound desk, doing Sunday school, Bible study groups. Paul wants to emphasize that each and every one of these works of service is a gift that we've been given from Christ for the good of his church. And that's why Paul then follows up in Ephesians 4 verse 7 with a quotation from Psalm 68. When he that is, what, that is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Now, initially, you might be wondering, what does this quotation have to do with what Paul has been talking about? This psalm, though, originally celebrated victory and rescue of, Egypt, of Israel from Egypt. And then God giving his redeemed people back to the world. 
It's this idea that these people have been rescued, they've been the captives in his wake, and they, are, they gave gifts to his people. They were set free to serve God. And Paul recognized that this Sam was looking forward to Christ. The fact that he had ascended to heaven after descending into the world to die for us. And the fact that then Christ gave us back as gifts to his church. We don't just have gifts. We are God's gifts to his church. So the church is not there in order to bless you as though you were a shopper filling your basket in a supermarket. The opposite is true. We are all saved, purchased by Christ, redeemed by Christ, and given to our churches as gifts to bless others by serving them. So how does this work? Well, Paul explains from verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Paul refers to many types of gifts that the church needs to build people up in Christ, to nurture their faith. But we are not just to be the receivers. Why are these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers given? To equip his people for the works of ministry. To equip every one of us for the different ministries that will grow and build the church and glorify God. So all of us have ministries we are all ministers. We're all to serve. We're all to be equipped by Bible teachers for the particular things that we're involved in. We need God's words to be applied to our lives. We need to listen to preaching, as we'll think about this evening. But every single person in the church is to be part of the ministry, is to have their own roles of service to serve God's people and to serve those around us. Church has been described as being a bit like a, a, a football match at times. 22,000 spectators desperately in, in watching on and, and not getting involved, and 22 players running around doing all the work. And if we compare Sunday church to a football match, maybe you think of church as a crowd of spectators, the congregation, gathering to watch the professional player, the minister, playing the game, doing their ministry of preaching. But Paul says that Bible teachers are given by Jesus to equip his people for works of service. It's the works of ministry of God's people, the congregation, that build up the church in unity and maturity. So it's not about the minister, the Bible teacher. The whole congregation are to be ministers. Jesus is using each one of us to build his church. So if we take the football analogy again, if our church was a football team, the players on the pitch would be the congregation. The ministers, elders, would be those who are the player coaches, who are training those on the pitch to play the game, helping them to love one another, love their community, and work together as a team. And the spectators are the watching world, unbelievers, our unbelieving friends, family, work colleagues, local community, our neighbors. And if we start to change our, uh, our perception on church, and think of it this way, that we're all the players on the pitch. We start to profoundly change the way we do church. The Bible teachers, whether employed or, or lay leaders, are not the only ministers. They are training everyone in the congregation to be ministering. So we've got everyone united, everyone ministering, and finally then, everyone mature or maturing. Paul uses three phrases, uh, very similar phrases, to describe the goal. He talks about us having unity in the faith. He talks about us <coughs> becoming mature and having the fullness of Christ, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, each one of these phrases is talking about maturity. It's having a shared understanding of what the faith is that we believe, what has been revealed to us in Christ. This idea is that none of us fully understand God. None of us fully understand what it means to be a Christian. And so we should all be constantly learning, constantly growing, constantly maturing. We're not to be content with maintaining a kind of childlike faith and childlike understanding. Our church needs to constantly allow itself to be reformed by the Spirit through His Word. If a church never changes, there's, there's two options. 
either the church is already perfect, which I think is probably unlikely, or the church is not listening to the Bible. Churches that are listening repentantly, seeking to live out God's word, will be constantly changing. We'll be constantly seeking each one of us to grow, to become mature. It's all too easy for us to be content as the kind of spiritual Peter Pan who never grows up. We come along to church, but we never move past that initial understanding. It's tempting to cling on to childish, immature views. But instead, Paul calls us to grow up, to grow in our understanding of God's word. Now, Jesus isn't uh, wanting us all to become academics. He doesn't want us to just wrestle with these grown-up questions to puff ourselves up. But he wants us to seriously engage with God's word, to seek to put it into practice, to be teaching our faith to others. If you're a parent, to be teaching it to your children, to be teaching it to those around you. We need to encourage each other to do this to attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, to be growing more like Jesus. Because there's not to be a disconnect between what we read, what we study, what we learn, and how we live our lives. Actually maturing is putting it into practice day by day. And growing up means that we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. We won't be like children going after the next craze. We need to grow up so that instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we are to speak truthfully to one another, lovingly to one another, We're to counsel each other appropriately in how the gospel affects our lives, our decisions, our attitudes. I think we need to rediscover the importance of gospel conversations where we talk to one another about the gospel, where we practice actually sharing it with one another, encouraging one another, so that we're then ready to go and tell others. This helps each one of us to grow in our faith, to mature in our faith, to learn from the experience of one another. Now, none of us must use this as an excuse to try and fix one another, to see each other as a project or to become judgmental of each other. We're to recognize that none of us are perfect and we have to have that same attitude of humility, gentleness, patience that we described already. We want the church to be a place where people can come from different backgrounds, different stages of their faith and explore what it means to follow God's word, to live this out where they are accepted but challenged, where we see God's word, the love, compassion, mercy that Jesus has for us, but we're also urged forward in our faith to live it out. Our world needs to see, of course, the relevance of our Christian faith to our lives. So we need to start talking about the difference it makes that we are following Jesus. We need to share that with one another and we need to share that with those out there in the world. So hopefully as as, as we think through all of this, you see that church growth needs all the limbs of the body united in gospel ministry. Everyone working together in this. All of us united, all of us ministering, and all of us maturing into the body of Christ, seeking to be more like Jesus and to live out his word, his work in our lives and in our world. And our church will only be united in these ministries if each one of us does our part. To put it simply, church growth is a team game. You're a vacant congregation right now, but you can't expect a minister to come in and fix everything, to be the one who does all the work. We all need to get involved. We all need to pull our weight and be involved in the work of ministry. So this passage teaches us that we need to maintain our unity, contribute our ministry, and grow in maturity. For this is how God gathers his church under Christ to display to the world who Jesus is, that he is the one who has rescued us, rescued us from ourselves, given us new life as members of his church. So don't neglect your part in the church. Get involved, play your part, live out your calling as a Christian to follow Jesus and to be involved. Let's pray. 
Lord God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the amazing gifts you have given us, all the blessings you have given us. We give you thanks for the salvation that is ours in Jesus, dying on the cross that we might be free. But we give you thanks as well for the great blessing that the church is, the people that you have placed around us as our family. We pray that you would help each one of us to get to know one another better, to be united with one another, to be ministering alongside them, to be seeking to serve where we can and help each one of us to be growing in our faith, learning more and more of the wonders of who you are and all that you have done for us and especially help us to then live that out in our day-to-day lives, help us to share our faith with those around us. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Going to conclude our service, going back to that psalm that we sung about, about being with God's people, dwelling with God's people, singing the second half of Psalm 84, verses 8 to 12, and the, the tune is Ottawa. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen.